How's everybody doing? Hey, we are glad that you're here and that you brave the weather. I don't know if you know this, but some Christians don't survive if they get wet. And, uh, but look at you guys. You made it. You're here. I'm glad. So let me tell you, uh, I, and I just so you know, I love telling this story, and I limit myself to telling it once a year because I love it that much. But anyway, or if not, I'd tell it all the time. So it's about 12 years ago. We were finishing a family vacation at Disney World, and my daughter Mia had been asking me the whole time that we were there if we could rent one of those Surrey bikes that they had. You know what that is? The, those are those kind of tandem bikes where three or four people sit on them and, and kind of pedal through. And so anyway, she had been asking me all week. And so the day that we left, I said, okay, we rented one for a half hour or so. Now, Mia was about five, Xander about two and a half, and Carrie was seven months pregnant. So the kids were too little to pedal. So we had to put them in the front. They had this little spot for kids where they could put their legs through. And then Carrie and I were in the back pedaling. And it was, the way it worked was where we, where we, the resort we were staying at, is kind of, it was around this, about a one mile circle around this lake. And so, and there was kind of this first hill and then it came down, then there was a second bigger hill and that was a little more intense. But anyway, we're going up, you know, we, we're kind of making our way around. We go up the hill and I'm pedaling as fast as I can. And my daughter, Mia, she, there, at the front, there's this little bell and, uh, and there, she's like, dad, faster, faster. And, uh, and I'm like, hey, my legs are on fire as it is. And so anyway, we make it the first way around and then we get back to where we started. We rent the bike. I'm like, All right, guys, we did it. Let's go home. And then Mia starts her chant like, one more time, one more time. Xander can't even talk yet. He's just going, you know, just, but he's trying, he's giving his, you know, a, approval. So I say, okay, so we go once more. We hit the first hill and my wife says, Bob, I'm sorry, I'm pregnant. I can't pedal anymore. So now I've got four people on this bike. I'm the only one pedaling. And so we finally make it through to the top. And then once you get to the top of the hill, you're kind of just, you know, cruising on the momentum. So that was easy. And we kind of make it, we go around. We get to the second hill, which was the more intense one. Um, and, and as we hit it, I get a, maybe a quarter of the way up. And uh, so, and, 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 I, and, and Carrie's like, um, she's like, Bob, I'm sorry, I can't pedal. I'll, I'll get off the bike so it's a little bit easier up the hill. And I'm like, but honey, you're pregnant. You know what, get off. And uh, so <laughs> she gets off the bike. And, uh, and, and so, and I make it probably about halfway up the hill and I can't, I mean, literally my legs are shaking and it, they're, they're, now I'm starting to go backwards a little bit. And I, I wasn't exactly sure what I was gonna do. And then I don't know what happened. I got this explosion of energy. And it was like, I mean, it was like, you know how you feel when you hear the Rocky music? The dun, 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 dun. Like, that's what I, I was like, and I'm making it up the hill. I turn around to tell my wife, like, can you believe this? And I see my wife pushing the bike <laughs> up the hill. And I, and, I, and I open my mouth and I'm like, honey, don't do that. And instead, I said, keep pushing. <laughs> and, uh, and so we, we make it and we're just about to the top of the hill. When right about then, this family of four, mom, dad, and these two little blonde girls, they're all riding the bikes. And then the girls are pointing at me and my wife, push, seven month pregnant wife, pushing the button. And they're like, mommy, why is the mean man make his wife push? I'm like, don't you judge me. And uh, you don't know me. And so now listen, this is the picture of so many marriages, right? We start out on kind of the marriage trail. We're pedaling together. We're in step and uh, we're happy. We're so blessed by who we got. You know, you're, you're saying this, you know, you wake up and you're like, I can't believe I got you. I look at you and I feel like I won the lottery. You know, you're in that. And then something happens, something changes. Our tune changes. And then we, then, then, you know, our, our, what we think changes. And we say, you know, when I look at you, it's like I entered a contest and lost. And, uh, and, 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 and then we start thinking that the, you know, the other person changed or the other person didn't change the way that we hoped they'd change. And we start thinking, maybe I should be on a different bike altogether. And, and we, st we start believing that there's someone that if I was pedaling with them, it would be so much easier and so much better. And we have this belief, and once again, we see it all throughout our culture, this belief that there's a soulmate out there for us. The perfect person that we were meant to be with forever. Our soulmate, they're perfect. They say the right thing. They always do the right thing. Your soulmate doesn't even have morning breath. They're the best. And, uh, and, and so, and too often, 
What keeps us from working on the marriage that we're in is this belief in the back of our minds that if it doesn't work out, that just means they weren't the one and the one is really out there somewhere. And listen, because we believe somehow that with your soulmate, everything works out. There's no conflict or fights. There's no differences or disagreements. There's just effortless harmony. And, and listen, it's a beautiful thought. It's just not true. And by the way, even the math of it doesn't work because all it takes is for one person to marry the wrong person and the whole soulmate thing. Because if, you're, if you go back, right, and your, your soulmate had to marry some, they made the mistake of marrying somebody else, then you had to marry somebody else, then they had to, their soulmate had to marry somebody. This is, listen, you, this could have been going all fine throughout history. 500 years ago, some bozo marries the wrong person, ruins it for everybody for all time. It doesn't work. I probably have thought about this more than I should. Uh, but listen, and this is the problem. The truth is a little harder to swallow, but it forces us to live in reality. And that is this, the, the day that we let go of the idea that there is a perfect person out there for us, we will fix the marriage that we're in instead of looking for somebody else to be the ticket to our happiness. Because the truth of the matter is every great marriage that you know is two people working hard to make it work. And listen, the marriage that we're going to look at today, oh, I appreciate that. That was a delayed reaction, but I receive it. I receive it. Now, the marriage that we're going to look at today, if there was anybody who could say he married the wrong person, it's this guy because he literally married the wrong person. But here's the thing that I think is so important is that I want to spend some time looking at this guy in particular, his spouse. And then the cool thing is, is that we get some perspective of him towards the end of his life as he looks back on everything that took place. And uh, so if I can, let me kind of take a couple steps back and set the scene for you. Jacob is the groom, and that's the guy we're going to spend some time looking at. Now, Jacob has a twin brother named Esau. Now, just to give you an idea, there's Abraham, father of our faith. We looked at him and his wife, Sarah, last week. They had a son, uh, Abraham and Sarah, they had a son named Isaac. Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, had twins. Jacob, who's the younger, Esau, who is uh, the older, and they were as different as can be. In fact, it, it gives this kind of juxtaposition of the two. It says that Esau was big and red and hairy. And, and that's why they called him Esau because the name Esau in Hebrew means big and red and hairy, which is kind of a perfect name for him. Uh, by the way, archaeologists have discovered a rendering of big, red, and hairy Esau. In fact, I, I have a picture of it. I'll show you. That's what he looked like. So anyway, <laughs> Esau loves you. And uh, so actually Esau doesn't. That guy was kind of a maniac. And so now Jacob, on the other hand, it says that uh, he was smooth skinned. He was not a hunter like his brother. He was, you know, like I said, he's more indoorsy, liked to cook and uh, that sort of thing. But one of the things that would happen is, is that towards the end of his life, Isaac wanted to bless his older son Esau. And the way it worked in that culture is you would be blessed with a double portion of the inheritance, and then you would also be blessed with a spiritual blessing that your father would give you. Well, Jacob, in cahoots with his mom, they trick Isaac, their dad, into giving Jacob the blessing. And Esau is just wrecked by this, and he is... He is totally unhinged. In fact, I want you to, how unhinged is he? Look at what it says, Genesis 27. And the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said, surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. That's the only thing that would make him feel better was the fact, he's like, I am so mad, <laughs> I'm gonna kill him. <laughs> okay, I'm all better now. It's like, once I murder him, I'll be fine. So this guy is unhinged. And so now, because Esau is going to kill his younger brother, Jacob, Isaac and Rebekah, their parents, say, look, you got to leave. She says, go to uh, this place, Padana Ram, which is where I'm from. I want you to find my uncle Laban, and I want you to go there. And in, our, in that family, I want you to find someone to marry and start a family. He tra Jacob travels there. It's a bit of a journey, but he travels there. And immediately he gets her. The first person that he meets is a woman by the name of Rachel. And he is instantly in love. And to me, one of the weirdest, most hilarious verses in the Bible is here in, in uh, Genesis 29. Look what it says. It says, and it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. This is it. And then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. 
Is there any more sign that Jacob has emotional problems? The fact that he sees this girl, is instantly in love, kisses her, and then is like, ah, and starts crying. Like, dude, what this, I mean, can you be any more emo than that? Like, relax. And so, anyway, so Jacob now is there. He's in love with Rachel. He's trying to figure out what he's going to do. He's having this conversation now with his uncle Laban. And he's like, hey, look, how can I marry your daughter? And uh, they're going to have a conversation about the future and where this picks up. So we're going to start in Genesis 29 and verse 15. Look what it says. It says, Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. And by the way, just as a little FYI, there's a, once again a contrast that's being made. Rachel is beautiful in form and appearance to look at. In contrast, Rachel's eyes were delicate. And this is where the Bible is being very kind. They're ba- the Bible's basically saying, when you saw Leah, your eyes kind of hurt. That's how rough she was. So <laughs> Rachel, on the other hand, you can look at it all day. So now, it says this in verse 18. Now, Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled that I may go into her. Okay, let me just tell, guys, let me just explain something. When you're going to talk to your father-in-law, these are the exact words to not use. Give me your daughter that I may go into her. Yo, throttle this back, my man. I know you've waited seven years. We all respect that. But maybe it's like, Laban, hey, good morning. How you doing? Hey, I'm just looking at my, my, my day planner here. I notice it's been seven years, and I would like to begin my life with your daughter. We're going to spend a wonder, have a wonderful life together. Anything but give me your daughter that I may go into her. You, dude, relax. Anyway, all right. People need to call me before they say stuff. Anyway, um, verse, <laughs> verse 20. I don't know why I'm saying this. Uh, verse 22. And Laban gathered together all the men of that place and made a feast. Now, it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. And, <laughs> and, uh, and Laban gave his maid Zilpah to her daughter Leah as the maid. And it came to pass in the morning that behold, dun, 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 it was Leah. By the way, that little dun, that's not in the original. That's me. And, uh, and, and then he, and he, Jacob, said to Laban, why have you done this to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? Now, if you pause there and give me your attention. Okay. This is so amazing on so many levels, okay? Um, so how does this, let's talk about it this way. Um, three things I want to talk about when we think about we married the wrong person. The first is this if you're a note taker. Understand how your past influences your present. Jacob has just had the biggest switcheroo of all time pulled on him. But it's only when we dig into the story that we realize that Jacob did this to himself. So let's do a graduate level study of this text, okay? First thing that you have to know is, is that Jacob is doing is experiencing what was done to him. What happened to Esau is now what happened to him. He was deceived by his uncle saying, hey, I'm going to give you my daughter, Rachel. And then he shows up in the morning and it turns out, I thought it was beautiful in form and appearance. Turns out it was old delicate eyes in the morning. What is going on here? And, um, but listen, this is exactly what happened. That Jacob tricked their father into giving him the blessing and now he is outraged that he has been deceived. Now, here's the other thing, and this is the question that people ask, and that is they'll say, how could this have possibly happened? Wouldn't he have known that it's not, that that it wasn't Rachel? You gotta understand, in that culture, people were, uh, women were heavily veiled. You weren't gonna see her face at at the wedding. And then at the wedding night, once again, we, we sometimes think it's like, you know, that, that Jacob was like, you know, hey, Siri, uh, turn the lights down by 50%. Let me say it's something. There was sunlight and candles and nothing in between. And so this was, it was a dark bedroom. As, and, and so he had no idea. When the sun came up is when he realized that it was Leah and not, uh, and, and, and not Rachel. Now, here's the thing that you've got to understand. And this is the thing that I think is really important. Had Jacob not been the deceiver, 
he would have ended up marrying Rachel. Why? Because once again, and, what the, and I know that this is kind of a weird thing and like, you know, someone marrying their cousin or whatever. This was, once again, it was a different time back then when, when Moses establishes the law at Mount Sinai, all of that gets banned. But at this time, this is what culturally people did, not just people that are Bible characters, but everyone in that culture did that. But here's the important thing. Uh, Laban had two girls. Re, uh, his sister, Rebecca, had two boys. It was going to happen that those, two were, that those people were going to get together. He, he was the younger son, which means he was going to be betrothed to Rachel. That's the way it was going to happen. And um, Esau was going to be uh, with old delicate eyes. And, uh, but, you know, once again, this guy's as hairy as Chewbacca, so he doesn't really have a lot of options as it is, so he just accepts what he gets. But once again, but because he knows that that's what's happening, he's so upset at his parents because they, even though Jacob was a deceiver and deceived him out of his blessing, his parents were still helping him. He's outraged at his parents that they didn't disown him over this. In fact, and, th and, and, and I want you to see what he does, and this is in Genesis 28. Look at what it says. It says, Esau knew that his father Isaac had blessed Jacob, had sent him to Padan Aram to find a wife, and that he warned Jacob, you must not marry a Canaanite woman. That's important. Look what happens next. He also knew that Jacob had obeyed his parents and gone to Padan Aram. So if Jacob is going to obey his parents, what is Esau going to do? Disobey his parents. Look what happens next. It says, it was now clear to Esau that his father did not like the local Canaanite women. Why? Because the Canaanite women worshipped other gods. They had all these detestable practices. And so Esau visited his uncle Ishmael's family and married one of Ishmael's daughter in addition to the wives he already had. Esau marries all of these women simply because his parents were still associating and helping Jacob, even after Jacob had deceived him, uh, had deceived his parents, and he feels betrayed by his parents. And so in doing so, he doesn't marry Leah, which is why Jacob is in the position that he's in now. And this is what brings up this idea of our past coming into our present. All of us bring our past into our marriage relationships. And, and, that is, and that's why when people say, oh, we're going to get married. It's going to be so much easier. No, it's not going to be easier because marriage is going to highlight everything that's influenced you, good or bad. And some of it is wonderful, and some of it is crazy, and, and, and some of it is just expectations that we brought into marriage, because whether you realize it or not, some of us come into marriage with very big expectations and other with more medium or smaller ones, but all of us have a bunch of expectations that we walk in. And my wife and I were laughing about this recently, and I'll tell you, but listen, don't judge me. I'm just telling you the truth. But when I got married, all right, I've been married for 26 years to my wife. And when I got married, I thought my wife was going to wear lingerie to bed every night. That's what I thought. And the reason I thought that is because growing up, that's what I saw on TV. My parents would watch all these, you know, all those dramas like Dallas. And I remember watching Dallas, Dynasty, Falcon Crest, you know, all of those. At which, by the way, why are my parents letting me watch this? That's a different sermon. But, um, but I'm watching all that. That's what all of those women wore to bed. So I thought... Oh, when I get married, you know, that's what my wife is going to wear to bed. And then I remember getting married, my wife shows up with like pajamas. I'm like, whoa, I didn't see this on Dallas. Uh, nothing, this didn't happen with the Ewing family. And, uh, and so what is going on here? And I, and I, and I remember like, you know what, what I, th I thought there was going to be like a French maid situation. Or at the very least, that Princess Leia metal bikini from Return of the Jedi. And, uh, and. I don't know if you know this, this might come as a shock to you, that conversation did not go well. And, um, and so, and now, you know, once again, now that I'm married, I realize it's not really sleepwear. It's more like activewear. But that's, that's also, <laughs> okay, uh, I don't know what's going on today, but I think it's the weather. I think it's this tornado. It's, it's whipping something up in me. So. Anyway, I'm moving on, or I'm going to get into more trouble than I'm already in. Dear Pastor Bob, subject line, lingerie. <laughs> that stuff all gets filtered out, so I don't even read that. So anyway, so now, but we all, <laughs> we all have expectations, and when they aren't intuitively met, and by the way, that's a key, that's an operative word, because we want our needs to not, or the expectations that we have to not just be met, we want them to be intuitively met. We want our spouse to see our marriage the same way that we do, and when they don't, we think there's a problem. 
And we start to question whether it is the love or sanity or interest or quality or deservedness of the person that we married. Listen, your spouse may have grown up and had a terrible home environment where they, where they grew up in, but that's the only home they knew. And so even if they thought it was awful and all they wanted to do was get out, they still don't know what a healthy home looks like. And that can be a source of conflict because you know what people do? They do what's modeled for them. And this is why, listen, and it is, it, 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 some of us would find it, we don't understand why until we really think about it, but this is why the children of alcoholics are statistically more prone to end up struggling with alcohol. Why? Didn't they see the problems? Children who grew up in violent homes with lots of anger um, have a tendency towards those same things. And it should be the opposite. So why does it happen? It's because it's the only thing they've ever known. And because even though they hated it when it was happening, they thought that's how every other family worked. When you get married, whether you realize it or not, you are bringing in all of that into your marriage and you're bringing all those expectations into your marriage. And the only way to combat it is to decide that all of those terrible things that happened when you were growing up, that they end with you. My wife and I, I told you this last week, we both grew up in somewhat violent homes and we made a decision when we got married. We said, all of this ends with us. That now, when we, we, us going forward, we are transforming our family tree from one of brokenness and hurt and shame to one of godliness and freedom and love and joy. And we, we were gonna transform that and we made that decision. And listen, and let me tell you what happens and I'm so grateful that I came to know Jesus at the age of 19 because I wasn't really, you know, there's a lot of things I wasn't really landed on. There was just some, some things that I'm like, yeah, I'm not really sure how I feel about that. And so I became a Christian and it wasn't like I became a Christian later in life where I'm like, oh no, I'm already convinced about these things. And now um, the Bible has to kind of convince me otherwise somehow. No, instead I'm like, yeah, I'm, I wasn't really landed. And so if that's what the Bible says, I'm just going to go with that. That decision to say, I'm going to go with that, listen, it caused me, Carrie and I, to, to avoid a lot of problems. My point is this. If Jacob had simply obeyed, rather than taking matters into his own hands, he would have ended up marrying Rachel and the person that he wanted to, and all of the mess that we're going to read about next, he would have missed. So what happens next? He's, remember, the question is, why have you deceived me? By the way, if you're not aware, you know what Jacob's name means? Deceiver. So this is, why have you Jacobed me, essentially, is what he's saying. Look what he says. Laban said, it is not to be done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week. Now, remember, he served seven years. The Hebrew word there is the word shabua, which means a week of years. So a decade is 10 years. A shabua is seven years. So fulfill her week, and we will give you this one also for the service which you served me still another seven years. Then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week, and he gave him... To, uh, he gave him his daughter Rachel as wife also. And Laban gave his, uh, his maid Bilhah to his wife Rachel as maid. And Jacob went into Rachel and he also loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served with Laban still another seven years. And if you pause there and give me your attention, here's kind of the plot that thickens a little bit more. The second thing I want you to know when, when we think we married the wrong person is that I need to realize how expectations can hurt me. Before we do the application of this, let me explain something. And it's like, why is he serving seven years uh, for, each of these, for each of these girls? And so, now, this was a dowry. Typically, what would happen is when a guy asked for um, the dad for his daughter's hand in marriage, the, the dad would set a dowry. And that is, he would set a price. Not a price like he was selling her. He would set a certain amount of money that was given to the father, to, to the 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 woman's father, that he would hold on to in case the guy turned out to be a total loser and she would be able to live on that money throughout her life. And so if you can imagine, it's basically like alimony in advance is what that was. But Jacob shows up without any money. He can't afford a dowry, so he's going to have to do some sweat equity to do this. And so he says, look, here's what I'm going to do. You serve me for seven years and whatever I would have paid you, I will set aside for my daughters as a dowry. And now he has to do it again for... Uh, Rachel, which is a second dowry. Now, this is the part of the story that's, that we don't realize as we're reading it until we get much later on. But let me explain. Laban gives each of his daughters a maid when they get married. And this is someone who would essentially serve the family, in particular the daughter. Um, so I want you to think kind of like Alice from the Brady Bunch. That's 
And if you're like, who's Alice from the Brady Bunch? That just means we can't be friends. And so, because everyone should know Alice from the Brady Bunch. So now, um, now here's the, here's the problem is that, and this is where everything starts falling apart. We're going to learn shortly in the verses that we read next that Leah realizes that she is unloved, and she, but she's able to have children. Rachel can't. So Rachel says, here, how about this? Why don't you have a relationship with my maid, Bilhah, and then those kids will be kind of accounted to me. And so Bilhah has two kids with Jacob. Leah sees that and says, I want you to take my maid, Zilpah. And she has two sons with Jacob. And by the way, at no time is there a verse that Jacob says, I don't know how I feel about this. I'm not some piece of meat. Uh, sometimes I just want to cuddle. There's no verse like that. And, um, and by the way, can I just share this real quick? And that is, uh, this is one of the problems that people will say they have with the Bible. Is, oh, it promotes polygamy. And uh, the Bible never condones polygamy. What it does is faithfully record what actually happened. Why is this important? Because these 12 children that are born become the, the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. The Messiah is, um, comes through the, the, the fourth son, Judah. And so we have to know the lineage of these kids because these are such important people in Jewish history. But once again, I think what's important to note is the Bible is never saying, you know, hey, polygamy is awesome. You should try it for yourself sometime. There's no verse like that. Instead, Robert Alder, who is an Old Testament scholar, has this great quote on the topic of polygamy. He says, if anyone thinks the Bible condones polygamy, it means they don't know how to read. Because ev every person in the Bible with multiple wives is having a terrible time. Um, and I'm, by the way, and I'm always taken back by a culture that says that love is love. Oh, you can love whoever you want. It doesn't matter. Um, has a real problem with this issue. And it's like, why are you judging how other people in other culture love? But yet that's, that's a real, that's a real issue. Oh, and, and you know, the culture says it's oppressive and bigoted to judge who you love. Unless of course, we're talking about the Bible and then it's perfectly fine. And that's how you know that this whole movement, you know, the alphabet people, um, this whole movement has nothing to do with rights and it has nothing to do with love. Ultimately, the, the, the movement is just demonic. And that's how you know, because it's always an issue with Christians. Okay, that's a sermon for another time, but we'll move on. Um, I appreciate that. Here is the issue for all of us, and this is the thing that's so important. All Jacob wanted was Rachel, and then he gets Rachel, and Rachel isn't enough. Then he has three other relationships with Leah, with Bilhah, with Zilpah, and, um, and, and now... Jacob is going into this relationship expecting something. And by the way, and here's how we know it never gets met, because now he has all this round robin relationship with all these other, other women and never once thinks about what it's doing to them. By the way, everyone is unhappy. And if we, if we were to keep reading, Leah says she's unloved. Rachel, if we go into chapter 30, she says, I, give me children or I'm, I'm going to die. Everyone, Jacob isn't satisfied. Everyone is a mess here. And everybody thinks everybody else is the problem. Leah thinks Rachel is the problem. Rachel thinks Leah is the problem. Everybody else thinks Jacob is the problem. Jacob says, you, got, you girls are all a mess. And listen, and this is the thing. All of them are thinking somebody else has to change. When the reality is, listen, sometimes it's us that has to change. But yet, that, a lot of times, that's the last person we're looking to that things has to change. A while back, uh, my wife was out, and I had one of my kids uh, with me. I can't tell you which, because my kids are at this age where they feel like they should have a say in what stories I tell. So now I have to pay a royalty every time I tell a story with them in it. But I don't have to pay if I don't mention their name. So I, I want to save a couple of bucks this week. So I'm going to not say which one. So anyway, I was with one of my children, and the child was about 18 months old. And we were watching a Red Sox game together, and that's when I smelled it. And um, this child had just dropped a bomb. And uh, so I take the child to the changing table, and that's when I realized that the diaper was not able to hold the full contents of what had just happened here, and it was leaking down their leg, and it was a nasty business. There was so much weeping and crying. My child was also upset. And, um, <laughs> and so... I take the diaper off and, and, and to try to clean this, and then the child puts their hands in the contents of the diaper and then starts rubbing it on my forearms. And that's when I nearly passed out. 
Now, um, I just kept saying, I'm like, this isn't happening. This isn't happening. So, uh, and then I, so I put the child into the tub, give them a bath, thoroughly wash and disinfect my arms. And, uh, and I'm like, look, we got to go somewhere. And so we go, I say, let's go to Publix. So, but you know what's weird is I, I, I put the child in the car and, um, and, and I could still smell it. And I'm like, my car stinks. I put the child in the cart. The cart stinks. I go into Publix. Publix reeks. And I'm like, what is happening to this world? This entire world smells like poop. And, um, and, and, and so, and then I'm inside Publix, right? I'm two or three aisles in. And I look down and I've got poop all over my shirt. And I didn't realize it. And here's the point. If your life stinks, it might be you. So, so, now, now, let me tell you, let me tell you something. This part's hard. I made you laugh now. Now's the hard part. Um, listen, I have more joy in my marriage than I think should be legally allowed. Um, but that all came um, years ago when I made a decision that I needed to change. And I had to take responsibility for everything that was wrong. A hundred percent. And I know this is like, well, you couldn't have been a hundred percent responsible. It doesn't matter. Um, you can only change things when you take responsibility. By the way, if you're saying, well, I hope my spouse is hearing this, you still don't, you don't get it. All right? Nothing changes in your marriage if you're standing around waiting for your spouse to be struck by lightning to get like this moment of inspiration or clarity. Um, and you're, you're powerless to do anything if you're waiting for the other person. When you decide to change and you allow the Lord to do a deep work in you, then everything begins to change because you're moving in God's direction. Instead of focusing on, but you gotta understand how they make me mad. Instead of focusing on that, how about this? Own your anger and allow God to transform you. Because, but the transformation doesn't happen until you own it. Instead of airing out all your disappointment because you have unmet expectations, realize this, that unspoken expectations are an impossible standard to set. And it's creating this vicious cycle of frustration, all because we don't want to communicate what we want. That, there's a fixable solution to that. But that doesn't happen. It doesn't get fixed until we own it and we allow God to transform us. And listen, there is so much joy on the other side of owning it. Now, I know that this is completely counterintuitive because everything in our lives is about not being wrong. And we're doing everything that we can that, oh no, it's not my fault. They said that, that's why I did that. So it's really not my fault. I'm a victim of circumstance. No, I did that. I didn't see the speed limit sign. That's why. It's not my fault I was speeding. There should be, no. Once again, you have to own it. And the, listen, the only person who can invoke change in a relationship is the person who owns it. That's a biblical principle. Um, here's what James says in James chapter four. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. You know what that means? The proud, it's not their fault. The proud, you made me do it, so it's not my fault. It's really, if I did something wrong, it's because you made me do something wrong, so it's really your fault. The proud, listen, God opposes proud people. But here's what it says. He gives grace to the humble. Humble people ask for God's help to change. Your marriage will be a lot better when you get on God's team. Well, look at what happens last. Verse 31. It says, When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me a son also, and she called his name Simeon, which means heard. She conceived again and bore a son and said, now my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi, which means attached. And then she conceived again and bore a son and said, now I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah, which means praise. And then she stopped bearing. If you pause there, and give me your attention. Last thing I want to tell you if you're a note taker, and that is open your eyes to God's blessing. Jacob spent his whole life wanting someone else except the wife that he woke up with that day. 
And it created nothing but problems and misery and sibling rivalry in his life. But now, we've been spending all this time in Genesis 29. I want to fast forward to Genesis 49. Jacob is now an older man at the end of his life. And he's talking to his second youngest son, whose name is Joseph. Now, at this point, Jacob has been giving blessings to all of his sons. Remember, one of his sons is going to, he, remember the whole thing about uh, he stole the blessing from Esau? Well, he's, he says, here's what he's going to do. He's going to bless all of his kids. And so he gathers them all, and he's blessing each and every one of them. But then he gets to Joseph, who is son number 11. And it says this, and you'll see it on the screen or in your notes. It says, then Jacob instructed them, soon I will die and join my ancestors. Bury me with my father and grandfather in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite. This is the cave in the field of Mechpala near Mamre in Canaan that Abraham bought from Ephron the Hittite as a permanent burial site. There Abraham and his wife Sarah are buried. There Isaac and his wife Rebekah are buried. And there I buried Leah. At the end of his life, he looks on at everything that's happened, all the kids, all the, the wives, the concubines, all the misery, and he says, listen, Joseph, bury me with Leah. Why? Because that's where the blessing was all along. Leah ends up having six sons. The fourth one that we learned, is his name was Judah, a name that means praise. Judah, the prophecy that the blessing that Jacob gives to Judah in uh, Genesis 49, right around verse 10, it says that Judah is like a lion and that the scepter will not depart from Judah. That is, Judah will be the kingly tribe and the scepter won't depart until Shiloh comes. And Shiloh has been understood that that is an ancient name for the Messiah. Judah has a descendant whose name is David, who becomes the king of Israel. Judah has a descendant named David. David later has a descendant named Jesus, the savior of the world. And whether it was prophetic or whether it was just some spiritual understanding, Jacob looks on at the end and he says, bury me with Leah because the blessing has always been with her. Listen, you might think the blessing is with somebody else and it's not. Listen, do you know that the, statistically, um, you know, there's a misnomer in our culture that 50% of marriages end in divorce. And that's kind of, it's not exactly true. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 37% uh, of first marriages end in divorce. 67% of second marriages end in divorce within seven years. And if you think that third time is the charm, 74% um, of third marriages uh, end in divorce. And, and what happens is I think a lot of times it's like we stuck it out in the first marriage and then it ended and we went to somebody else. No, it's going to be better this time and we learned it's the same thing. It's still hard. It still takes work. We still have to invest. You see, the issue isn't finding somebody new. The issue is becoming somebody new. Allowing God to transform you so that he can then transform your marriage. Let me give you a different stat. If a couple have a deep faith in God, read the Bible and pray daily together, attend church weekly and serve at church, you have a 1 in 1,015 chance of your marriage ending. I'll close with this. Here's what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, a famous passage. He said this. He said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Listen, when you're a kid, you believe the fairy, tale, uh, fairy tales that everyone lives happily ever after without any effort. You think, well, two people just get together and it just works. That's not the way love and marriage works. Love and marriage take time. It takes work for it to work out. It takes a commitment that we're going to stay together no matter what, and we are going to work to make it not just something we endure, but something that brings tremendous joy. At some point, we have to put away childish things to put away the childish idea that there's a perfect person out there who will just make marriage easy with no effort. Every happy, healthy, and God-honoring marriage that you, that you know is two people who are working hard to make it work. That they aren't looking for somebody else. Instead, they're looking at themselves to see how they become the person that God created them to be. And they are committed to the person that God brought them. And they're looking to that person saying, hey, it's you and me forever, no matter what. 
That kind of love, that's a kind of love that can go the distance. And that's the kind of love that can bring you a lifetime of unspeakable joy. Let's pray together. And Lord, we want to thank you for that. We thank you for that promise that the blessing was with Leah all along. So God, help us. Help us to invest in our marriages. Help us to invest in our relationships. Help us to have our marriage be something that represents who you are and everything that you can do when you transform a human life. God, help us. I I pray for every marriage and relationship in this room that you would do the work that only you can do in and through us as we own it, as we take responsibility, and as we surrender to you. And we pray it in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus and begin a relationship with him, congratulations. It's the best decision you're ever going to make. You may be wondering, so what happens now? Where do I go from here? Just text BEGIN to 62488, and we'll be able to send you this free gift. It's a book called BEGIN, written by Pastor Bob, and it's going to help you take those first steps on your new journey of faith. So remember, to stay up to date with everything happening at Calvary, follow at my Calvary on Instagram and Facebook. Till next week, we love you, we're praying for you. God bless you.